thank you all for being here today. Um, I realize it's the first of the grand rounds for this quarter. And what I wanted to do was to really follow up the first lecture from January presented by Dr. John Thompson from Washington State Newborn Screening Lab, where he described the process that it takes to get a rare genetic disease added to the newborn screening panel here in Washington. And one of the big examples that he, he spent some time discussing was X-linked adrenal leukodystrophy as the newest addition to Washington. And so I wanted to present today kind of the, the implications of that and some, some questions I actually had going into this year and even actually into March of 2018 when they go live with this testing of, you know, what does this really mean? What, what might the lab face with expanded newborn screening for this disease? So before we start, I have no dis specific disclosures. And I'm hoping by the end of this lecture, you'll be able to identify three clinical fe features of X-linked ALD, describe two challenges to predicting the disease symptoms and disease progression, and then also list two possible therapies for this disorder. Now, I want to open with a case study as it turns out, this was a case that crossed my desk about two weeks after that January lecture describing newborn screening and XALD. And this was a, a six-year-old boy who was admitted to the emergency uh, department after 24 hours of pretty intense vomiting. Um, other than that, physical exam was unremarkable. Uh, notes in the ED notes suggested this was possibly a viral illness, but Given the severity, they were going to go ahead and work him up. Uh, it was noted in his clinical history that the prior year he had had pretty poor weight gain. In fact, he'd, his weight had shifted from the 98th percentile down to the 50th percentile. And he'd had several episodes of fever associated with vomiting and hypoglycemia down to the 40s. So with this history and, and the admission, they went ahead and ordered kind of a standard metabolic screening panel. So these are broad tests that come to the biochemical genetics laboratory. And they were pretty nonspecific, very consistent with his clinical picture of vomiting. So amino acids were low to normal. He hadn't been eating a whole lot. Uh, elevations of C2 and C4 corresponding to uh, ketosis and same features in the organic acids. Now, further inspection of his features identified uh, some characteristics that were a little bit concerning and prompted a referral to endocrinology. Uh, specifically, the vomiting, he was a little bit irritable while he was admitted. Uh, specifically, the poor weight gain of the previous year and the hypoglycemia. So endocrine went ahead and worked him up for a possible uh, issue with his uh, adrenal gland. And when they attempted adrenal stimulation, there was no response consistent with adrenal insufficiency. Now, typical other features of primary adrenal insufficiency are uh, changes in skin color, extreme fatigue, hyponatremia, um, abdominal pain. Uh, none of these were applicable, but he still had enough that this was concerning, and the tests came back uh, negative for uh, stimulation response. So, this sent him back to the biochemistry lab and a rather specialized test called very long chain fatty acids. And this is actually what his profile looks like. And when I say specialized tests, I mean, it's typically done in biochemical genetics labs. And if you Google search clinically available very long chain fatty acid analysis, uh, their primary hits are uh, ARUP, Mayo, Quest, Seattle Children's, and Oregon Health Sciences University. So there's less than probably six labs in North America that perform this assay. There may be some other smaller labs that do it, but not major Google hit uh, results. So what we saw here on this test were eleva several elevations. Um, and it was a pattern in particular that made us concerned about X-linked adrenal leukodystrophy. So what we have here, uh, these numbers correspond to carbon chain lengths of the fatty acids. So largest elevation is of C26, followed by C24, a little less common, but can be seen. And it's specifically the ratios of these two metabolites to the 22 length carbon. So 
with this abnormal biochemistry, we interpreted this as concerning for X-linked adrenal leukodystrophy, recommend gene evaluation, and a referral to biochemical genetics. So this was the first real ca like live case of X-linked adrenal leukodystrophy that I'd seen and been involved in the initial diagnosis of, which got me thinking a little bit about the, the specificity of the test. And we've now handed this kid a rare genetic disease that's going to need some additional workup. What does that really look like for him? And you know, 2018 is a bit different from several years ago uh, when there, there's been hype over in uh, media at various points about XALD. So what's, what's coming that's new? Where is the technology right now? And what might things look like with the addition of newborn screening for this disorder? You know, it's one thing when you're testing a bunch of patients that are presenting symptomatically. Uh, our volumes are relatively low. It's a fairly targeted question. Uh, now we're going to be screening every baby in the state for elevated C26. What other diseases might start popping up that we wouldn't necessarily think about? So to go after these questions, I'm going to start with a little bit of background, very broad. We'll talk a little bit more about uh, the specifics of the diagnostic testing talk about what therapy options are available and what might be coming down the pipeline, and then finish up with a little bit of discussion about patient care strategies and, again, implications of newborn screening. So taking a step back, uh, inborn errors of metabolism and newborn screening, these are both very, very broad topics. But inborn errors of metabolism is a very general term for diseases that are genetically based disrupt metabolism, and there's thousands of these that have been described at this point. Generally, for uh, metabolic disorders, there's an accumulation or, and or absence of normal metabolites, and sometimes there's the appearance of metabolites that are very unusual, secondary to the biochemical pathways being disrupted. And so these are kind of the, the key features of an inborn error. Uh, not all the time. Genetics likes to break the rules. But often, infants are born and they appear healthy at birth. They can be discharged, and some variable amount of time later, they start to present symptoms, and the disease progresses over time. So in, uh, in the ideal situation, newborn screening was actually created to identify rare inborn errors of metabolism that were uh, easy to detect so readily identifiable by laboratory testing. They were treatable, and early intervention made a significant difference in the lives of the patients. It changed the long-term outcome for these individuals. And so with these kind of pillars of philosophy behind newborn screening, at this point, there's about 30 diseases that have been recommended at the federal level on the recommended uh, universal screening panel, the RUSP. Uh, f that's a guideline for states to develop their own particular panels. Every state's a little bit different with different population concerns. But the general idea is we go after these diseases, screen for them early on, connect them with appropriate resources and early therapy intervention to, again, change their long-term outcome and hopefully change uh, their quality of life. Some classic success stories of newborn screening are really, uh, here are three diseases that I picked out that are nearly universally screened for. Uh, phenylketonuria, biotinidase deficiency, and medium chain acyl-CoA dehydrogenase deficiency. And all three of these, I think, really embody the intent behind newborn screening. Uh, in the case of phenylketonuria, PKU was actually the original motivator for establishing newborn screening in the early 1960s, because early dietary intervention is protein restriction, which, while not easy to maintain lifelong, is relatively straightforward, and it does work. And it reduced neurological handicap in PKU patients from 80 to 90 percent of patients having neurological challenges down to less than 10 percent. So this is a very dramatic shift in quality of life for them. Biotinidase deficiency. This is an enzyme disorder that's involved in biotin, or B7 metabolism, that when untreated can initially present with skin abnormalities, uh, eczema and alopecia, 
but in more severe con cases can progress to sensory neural hearing loss, optic atrophy, seizures, and even coma. However, with your daily pharmacological biotin supplementation, all of those clinical symptoms can be avoided. And then medium chain acyl-CoA dehydrogenase deficiency. This is a, a defect in fatty acid oxidation, so primary energy production in the mitochondria. Uh, when this enzyme doesn't work, patients are prone to hypoglycemic events, relatively rapid onset. They can fall into a coma very quickly. And if you don't know that the patient has this enzyme disorder, it can take time to make the diagnosis. So with early identification via newborn screening, maintain basically dietary intervention and preventing hypoglycemic events dramatically reduced the mortality rate. Um, I've seen numbers that are even smaller than this with the death rate at the first presentation basically going to nearly zero. So these are three disorders, relatively straightforward interventions that all present in their classic form within the first year of life and with we can easily diagnose them, we can intervene and change what happens. Now, XALD, I would argue, is kind of the first of a new class of diseases that we're expanding newborn screening to include. Uh, XALD, short for X-linked adrenal leukodystrophy, is characterized by behavioral changes, adrenal insufficiency, ataxia, spastic paresis, can have, patients can suffer from sphincter dysfunction, alopecia, and in the most severe cases, they can experience progressive neurologic deterioration. Um, it's relatively rare, but on par with many of the other ge uh, genetic disorders uh, that are part of newborn screening. And Washington State specifically started planning to include this disease on newborn screening in 2014. It took four years and a lot of hard work by the newborn screening team and effective March 1st, all babies in the state of Washington will be tested for this disease. Now, we are actually the sixth state in the country to implement XALD screening, New York being the first in late 2013. So in the timeline of rare genetic disorders, we are actually at, at the forefront of this. There's not a lot of published data about the long-term outcomes and even the implications of newborn screening, but it's also a really exciting time. You know, we're going, we will be identifying these patients earlier, uh, and in the next section, I'm gonna be talking a little bit more about the disease and kind of what that means. So let's get into some of the, the logistics of X-linked ALD. Now, I mentioned there are a variety of symptoms associated with this disorder. Uh, I want to focus the rest of the talk really on the neurologic components of XALD. Again, the most severe form, often referred to as the cerebral form, is characterized by a progressive neurodegeneration. It can be variable in the amount of time. It can be variable in the age of onset. Typically, when this happens, uh, boys are between the ages of 4 and 10 years old. There's always exceptions, but that's the general eight target age range of when the, they're picked up symptomatically. Uh, adrenal insufficiency, primary adrenal insufficiency, or Addison's disease, is a, another very common feature of XALD. And patients that present usually later in life, sometimes in their 40s, 50s, or 60s, uh, often the features that they have are this uh, spinal cord demyelination and axonal degeneration. So it starts in the extremities, usually as a tingling in the feet that progresses up their legs. Uh, it'll be referred to as AMN for the rest of the lecture. These are kind of the three main categories of neurologic symptoms. The severe cerebral form can be treated, and I'm gonna go into more detail later, but it can be treated with bone marrow transplantation. The adrenal insufficiency can also be treated with hormone replacement therapy. But we've got three different categories, and the frequencies are highly variable. As implied from the name, ALD is an X-linked gene. So males are more affected than females. And any one patient can have any combination of these symptoms. So you'll notice at no point do these add up to 100%. <laughs> um, there's a suspicion that the females who are affected by ALD are under-recognized. 
again, they tend to present later in life when they are identified. So you'll notice in here on the table, under the AMN category, it's thought that maybe as many as 65% of females have this neuropathy. Uh, again, numbers are unclear. We're not sure how much of the population we're actually uh, querying with that. And there are known cases of females presenting with a severe cerebral form. There are very few, uh, usually unusual genetic situations, but it is possible. Now, males are a little bit more predictable, only a little. Uh, as I mentioned on the previous slide, the cerebral form is one that we can treat, and early identification is very critical. However, it's only between 35 and 40 percent of males are going to develop the cerebral form. And of those, the 90 percent with inflammatory features, those are going to be rapidly progressing. So it can be in a matter of months to up to two years, they can go from normal functioning, running around, playing with their friends, to a vegetative state. A small subset of that have evidence of brain atrophy, but then stabilize. We don't know yet what the difference is or I'd be able to identify these other than watching them and monitoring their brain via MRI. Uh, our middle column here, Addison's disease. Most patients suffer from this to, very, to some degree. It's thought that maybe as many as 70% of boys end up with adrenal insufficiency. So early identification of this symptom and people at risk for this uh, symptom will certainly help with their long-term treatment. It will minimize the risk of adrenal crises and get them on hormone replacement therapy early on. So we've got three different big categories of neurologic disease, but what's really going on here? This is a biochemistry talk. So we need to start talking about the biochemistry. Now, peroxisomes are kind of the, the least known organelle from undergraduate cell biology classes. But as it turns out, this organelle does a lot of really cool things. There's a ton of chemistry that happened within these. And these are, like I said, organelles, so they're characterized by a lipid bilayer. They're relatively acidic. And they do, they're involved in uh, lysine breakdown, so amino acid catabolism. They do bile acid synthesis. They're involved in synthesis of some steroid hormones. And the pathways I'm going to focus on today are related to very long chain fatty acids. These very long chains can be broken down for energy, or they can be used as building blocks to make plasmalogens. I'll talk about that a little bit more in another slide. But the point here is that peroxisomes do a ton of chemistry, pathways that we don't necessarily think about on a day-to-day -day basis, but they're in fact really integral to basic metabolism. We're not gonna look, talk about every pathway here, but what I wanted to point out is all of the boxes in yellow represent pathways that are located within the peroxisome. And these are closely tied to energy production in the mitochondria, uh, indicated at the top of the slide here in this blue box. And they're also closely related to activities within the endoplasmic reticulum here in the green box. So these really are very important organelles that can have things go haywire and cause disease. So like I said, we're going to talk about a subset of the chemistry that happens in peroxisomes, and it's really related to the fate of very long chain fatty acids. There are two things that can happen to these fatty acids. They can be broken down into shorter chains because the mitochondria are really effective at breaking down uh, fats that are 18 carbons and shorter. The longer carbon chains don't get into the mitochondria. So step one is for a very long chain fatty acid to be transported into the peroxisome, go through a series of steps in beta oxidation to make it a shorter chain. It's then shipped off for, to make ATP. The other possible fate of very long chain fatty acids is to be incorporated into plasmalogens. Now this is a, a class of membrane lipids that are highly variable. So you can incorporate different length very long chain fatty acids at the R groups, so R group one or R group two, and they can have different kinds of uh, polar heads at position X. And it's thought that plasmalogens 
are important players in modulating plasma, member, plasma membrane fluidity, and that plasmalogen content is highly variable between different cell types and different tissue types. So with that in mind, we need to talk about the protein. The XALD protein is encoded by the ABCD1 gene, which is short for ATP binding cassette subfamily D member one. This is in fact the protein that is part of the peroxisomal lipid membrane that is responsible for active transportation of those very long chain fatty acids into the peroxisomal matrix. This is a fairly respectable protein. It's got 745 amino acids. And at this point, thousands of mutations have been described, although 799 are non-recurrent mutations. The vast majority of cases are inherited. Uh, depending on which paper you look at, somewhere between 4 and 20% are de novo mutations. So mo most commonly, it's, the mutation will come from mom, will be inherited. And as of now, despite all of this data and mapping the mutations around, along the protein, there is no genotype-phenotype correlation. And in fact, we don't really have a clear picture of the pathophysiology. Uh, it's known that many of these mutations disrupt protein production. So uh, assays looking for protein uh, come up negative in patients with XALD, but there's a lot of pathways that are implicated. Again, going back a couple of slides, we know this is an integral part of metabolism. So in cell culture and in model systems, there's evidence of mitochondrial dysfunction, reduced ATP production, presumably from uh, poor beta oxidation and reduced substrates there. There's evidence of oxidative stress and an increase of reactive oxygen species. There's also evidence of basic cell toxicity. So axons and oligodendrocytes seem to be particularly susceptible to elevated concentrations of the C26 fatty acid in particular. This seems to, just adding C26 to the culture media will disrupt the myelin. It produces lipid inclusions, actually pictured here on this slide. They can form these needle-like structures. Uh, they will. There's reduced plasmalogen synthesis. This is measurable in patients. And there seems to be some degree of membrane destabilization um, characterized by cult, uh, fibroblast cultures. We also know that inflammation and the immune response, it is an important part of disease progression, particularly for the cerebral form of ALD. There seems to be activation of macrophages. The blood-brain barrier is compromised so that T and B cells can begin invasion of the brain causing cell apoptosis uh, and presumably is a part of the progressive atrophy. But under what circumstances are each of these pathways triggered and at what degree? At this point, we can't predict for any one patient. It's thought that there are even environmental factors and possibly epigenetics that play an important role in symptom progression based on case reports of families where they carry the exact same mutation, they live in the same place, and they will have completely different phenotypes, different ages of onset. There's even a case report of monozygotic twins that do not follow the same clinical uh, scenario. So we know that mutations in the gene are a risk factor. We can see abnormalities, but at what point do those cause clinical symptoms? And how severe will those symptoms be, we don't know yet. But let's go back to some things that we do know. I said we could measure, we could measure these abnormalities. And in fact, a clinical assay for identification of, very, of XALD was first offered in 1981. And it was based on this idea that there was, based on the observation that there were these fat inclusions and they were identified as primarily C26. So we know the XALD protein is a, a transmembrane transporter of the peroxisome. When it doesn't function, very long chains begin to accumulate in the cytosol. There is a bias for the C26, and this spills out into the plasma. So we can take patient, patient blood, spin down the plasma, and analyze that in our, our GC mass spec. Uh, 
uh, pictured here, and quantify these different species. Now, this is a lab talk, so we gotta talk about some assays. Very briefly, uh, first we have to hydrolyze, do some incubation steps, changing the acidity to do that hydrolyzation step. We then use an organic solvent extraction to remove the fats from any other protein and, and cell debris. We'll dry it down, derivatize it, dry it down again, and then resuspend those fats in hexane in order to detect them very specifically in the mass spec. So we end up with uh, relatively uh, unique clean peaks for each of the fatty acids, specifically C26, C24, and C22. So as shown earlier, we end up with results that look something like this. And again, this is a very characteristic pattern for X-linked ALD, where C26 is the most elevated. C22 is often normal. Elevations of C24 can be seen, and in particular, the ratios of C24 to C and C26 to C22 can be very helpful in identification of these, of these patients. So we can measure biochemical abnormalities, and when we compare this to the, the clinical phenotypes, I've got here three different graphs. On the x-axis, we have those uh, clinical phenotypes with adrenal insufficiency, uh, the cerebral form, uh, sometimes characterized by seizures in clinic notes, and then the adult onset uh, AMN phenotype. And this is all data actually collected at Seattle Children's in our laboratory. Uh, Y-axis on the furthest graph is the concentration of C26. And you can see for basically everybody, it's elevated. However, our adult onset form is the most elevated number of the set. And the same pattern holds true with the ratios. So everybody is above the red line, which indicates upper limit of normal. Uh, and they're all abnormal for the C26, C22 ratio. We get more of a spread for the C24 to C22. So this is not a guaranteed marker, but it can be helpful in identifying the overall pattern. So this is the biochemistry, but normally we don't start there. So I want to talk briefly about what is the typical diagnostic sequence looks like for a patient with XALD. Historically, they presented symptomatically, either with uh, adrenal dysfunction or they may show up in the neurology clinic with neuromuscular abnormalities, that uh, spastic paraparesis, uh, which would trigger an MRI analysis. So either specialty would usually see the patients first. And based on their findings and tests that were ordered, would make them think of it ALD. Next step is to go to the biochemical genetics lab. That's us, for very long chain fatty acid analysis. Now, the vast majority of cases are gonna have elevated C26, but it is noted in the literature that obligate heterozygous females can be normal. Uh, the data for this is probably limited, so we're gonna have more fun once newborn screening comes in and our, our sample size really starts to increase. We may start seeing some new trends and adjust that percentage. Once we see abnormalities in the biochemistry, this prompts DNA sequencing. However, DNA sequencing is not as straightforward as we like. We'd like, there are four known pseudogenes on other chromosomes, specifically chromosomes 2, 10, 16, and 22. And these pseudogenes have very high sequence identity to ABCD1. It's 92 to a 96 percent identity, which means from a practical standpoint, next generation sequencing can't sequence this gene reliably. It needs to be done usually with Sanger sequencing and very carefully designed primers to make sure that you get the gene from the X chromosome. So a lot of labs don't do this. And final step would be Assuming you've got abnormal testing on very long chains and DNA sequencing, you're gonna wanna test the other thing that may have not presented initially. So if there was adrenal function, as in our case study, next step is gonna be evaluation by MRI to look for any cerebral changes that were, still, that were not yet presenting with behavioral abnormalities. Or vice versa, if the patient came in with neurologic dysfunction, you then wanna make sure to check the adrenal function and make sure there's not something missed there.
Now, since we're talking about brain MRI, and this wasn't part of our case study, I wanted to make sure to show you a, a classic picture of X-linked ALD. It's, there's a very characteristic chain, series of changes that happens to the white matter indicated here. So it is progressive, it is bilateral, it starts, starts in the posterior of the brain and is visible um, on enhanced T2 signal. It generally progresses from the corpus callosum outward. And again, that rate of progression can be variable case to case. It's noted that gadolinium enhancement can be very helpful to identify when inflammation starts to play a role and that activation of the immune system. This tends to correlate with uh, increased speed of the degeneration and progression of the neurologic deterioration. So this is a, an additional test that's not every time but can be useful for monitoring. Now, when we're talking about testing, uh, particularly from the biochemistry side, I was curious about other diseases that could result in elevations of C26. So particularly for these infants that are flagged by newborn screening, they're not going to be symptomatic yet. What else might we be identifying that may not be showing symptoms? And again, ALD is part of an integral part of the peroxisome for transporting a very long chain fatty acid. So really any enzyme in those pathways that are involved in fatty acid uh, metabolism can be hit by mutations. Now, historically, these disorders, paroxysomal diseases, were described phenotypically by clinical symptoms, and they had a variety of names. With the expansion of DNA sequencing, they're getting both lumped and subdivided a little bit more cleanly. So the single biggest category is Zellweger spectrum disorder, which is now thought to incorporate the previous terms of infantile refsum and neonatal ALD, which were thought originally to be separate diseases. They had slightly milder phenotypes or more aggressive phenotypes, but it's, they all seem to be within uh, the PEX family of genes. There's at least 14 genes now that are thought to cause Zellweger spectrum disorder. And that's, uh, we've got the C26 associated with spe Zellweger spectrum here in this middle column. And you'll notice that these elevations can go very high, where, whereas our XALDs will go from you know, zero, maybe up to two micrograms per mil. The Zellweger spectrums go up nearly to six, so much greater elevation, with again, the red line indicating our upper limit of normal. And then there's the poorly characterized peroxisomal biogenesis category. Um, this is a term that has historically been used when gene sequencing was not as readily available and from cell analysis, cytology, we could tell something was wrong with the peroxisomes, but couldn't necessarily tell what specifically. There was some degree of abnormalities in the very long chains, but couldn't pin it down more specifically than that. With expanded sequencing, we're now identifying other genes, and I've listed some of the enzymes here. Many of these are very limited case reports, so one case, maybe three cases. Um, not enough that you necessarily want to say, this is how all of these patients look, but there's a problem with the way the peroxisomes function and it's affecting very long chain fatty acid metabolism. So this is kind of our catch-all group here on the side. And you can see there's, they are a pretty broad spectrum. Depending on what the mutation was and which gene, uh, some of this data is historical, so we didn't have DNA analysis for these cases. So this may in fact be a Zellweger spectrum, unknown. So. Zellweger is a big category, so I want to talk about it a little bit more. These cases tend to be pretty severe neonatal onset. They have very distinctive facies, dysmorphology, uh, marked partic in particular by very large forehead, uh, wide spacing eyes, and they have major complications, including hypotonia, seizures, uh, neurodevelopmental delay. They can have cataracts and retinopathy. Uh, liver disease and bony stippling are often uh, features that can be seen in Zellweger spectrum. And these infants usually don't make it more than a couple of years, depending on their, their clinical features. Uh, so when we look at 
our, our biochemistry markers between these different categories of diseases. I wanted to look in a little bit more carefully at C26, C22, and C24. In our XALDs all the way over on the left, uh, we've got the y-axis is concentration. And you'll notice that kind of as we mentioned before, C22 is often normal. C24 can be elevated with our red lines here indicating the upper limit of normal in all cases. And despite the axis, all C26s are elevated here in this category. It's a little hard to see, but they are abnormal. In comparison to our Zellweger spectrum, where C26 is more elevated, but that's really the, the biggest marker for Zellweger. And our peroxisomal biogenesis, as mentioned before, is kind of across the board. But this is looking at the, the single metabolites and their absolute concentration. Now, when we look at the ratios to help us out a little bit and make these, these levels a little bit more differentiated, we can see, again, XALD is all the way over here on the left. The top graph is our ratio of C26 to 22. This is gonna be one of our more reliable markers for XALD. Uh, our scale here goes up to 0.1 in comparison to that ratio for Zellweger spectrum where it can go all the way up to one, so almost 10 times greater. Our C24 to C22, not surprising, sometimes informative, sometimes not, but in, compared to our Zellweger spectrum, these are also, for all the data that we had, they were all elevated significantly above normal. And again, our peroxisomals are somewhere in between. So from a biochemistry standpoint, it appears from our limited data set that we should be able to differentiate XALD from Zellweger spectrum. If we add on top of that the clinical features, it should be, fairly, it should be very straightforward to differentiate these two categories of disease. Peroxisomal biogenesis ones may be more challenging, and those will be more of an unknown category of lesser known genes. Um, as I mentioned at the beginning of the talk, newborn screening for XALD is very new. In fact, there's only one, only the state of New York has published their experiences so far, and they described the results that they collected from a year and a half worth of data and over 300,000 newborns. They identified 13 males with ABCD1 mutations, so some form of XALD, 13 heterozygous females, four cases of Zellweger spectrum disorder, one case actually of Klinefelter syndrome. So this is a 47 chromosomes, two X's and a Y, and one of those X's in fact carried a mutation in ABCD1. They said they identified one case of Acardi Gutierrez. There wasn't an explanation for why. But the point here is that once we start looking we don't know yet what we will find, and we may find some other diseases that we would have never thought to test for very long chain fatty acids, because up till now, we've been screening for them based on clinical presentation and clinical history. So it's gonna be interesting. For the cases of XALD, which is what we're going after, there is therapy. And there's several different steps depending on which symptoms you have. As mentioned, the majority of cases do have adrenal insufficiency. So hormone replacement therapy, endocrine has this well sorted out. They can do it, it works very well. Early identification of patients at risk is going to be helpful, absolutely, in their long-term health development, growth, um, having them plugged into that service. The rest of the therapy options listed here, two of them are available, Lorenzo's oil and bone marrow stem cell transplant. And there are kind of two approaches that are in the clinical trial phase, uh, small molecule gene therapy and gene replacement therapy. Uh, both recently had publications and are exciting new possibilities. So we can't talk about X-linked ALD and not give a nod to this movie. It came out in the early 90s called Lorenzo's oil and it was a very heartfelt adaptation of some history around the disease and some early efforts that were made to try to develop a therapy based on the biochemical abnormalities. And this family who actually had a son that was affected with the disorder uh, did a ton of research and they actually helped to figure out that 
the accumulation of C26, a lot of it was coming from a positive feedback loop within the cell. So the absence of plasmalogens was causing the peroxisome to send signals to the endoplasmic reticulum to synthesize more C26. So no matter how much fat you cut out of the diet, the, C22, the C26 levels would continue to rise. And so they developed this oil that was intended to be a combination of shorter substrates that would act as inhibitors for the enzymes in the endoplasmic reticulum that were synthesizing the C26 in the first place. So it was a, a mixture of C8, uh, unsaturated C18 and C22 that successfully does normalize the C26 in plasma. It takes several weeks, but it does normalize the biochemistry. Unfortunately, up until now, there's never been um, carefully controlled, placebo-controlled cohort studies. And the comparisons that have been done on long-term outcomes of patients who have taken Lorenzo's oil to those who have not, have not shown any significance in the oil. There's been no apparent change in long-term outcome for these patients. So it is, a th it is out there. Um, it is no longer in clinical trials. My conversations with various clinicians, they approach this with a lot of caution. It, it may be more placebo than anything else. And it goes back to the idea that we don't really understand the pathophysiology. There's several pathways at work here, and so normalization of the C26 may not be enough. However, we do know something that does work. Bone marrow transplantation has made a big difference for XALD patients with the cerebral form of the disease. And what we have here uh, is a graph that shows the survival curve of non-transplanted patients here in red compared to a set, a, a, a small cohort. So this was 19 patients who were transplanted. Now, there are some caveats to this. Um, Bone marrow transplantation is now the standard of care, so it does work. But uh, several stu many studies at this point have demonstrated that the earlier the transplantation is done, the better your long-term outcomes, the more quickly patients recover, they do better socially. Uh, there's, it takes time for the, the transplantation to take effect, so it can be up to 12 to 18 months post-transplant for the cerebral changes to stabilize and stop changing. So the neurodegeneration can progress for some time, which means you're really racing the clock for these patients. You want to identify the 35 to 40% that are going to have this progressive cerebral form, but you want to catch it early, early enough that you can initiate the bone marrow transplant before too much damage has occurred. Uh, in fact, the more progressive the neurologic damage, the less effective the bone marrow transplant is. Now, a lot of the data around the transplant technology is in comparison to cancer patients. And in XALD patients, and even inborn errors of metabolism in general, there's a much higher rate of graft failure. It's somewhere in the vicinity of 18 to 20 percent in comparison to leukemia patients, which are about 5 percent. And graft-versus-host disease is a pretty significant risk. That's a long-time complication of transplantation. Um, another interesting thing that I learned was that in comparison to cancer patients which, who have typically undergone several rounds of chemotherapy, uh, inborn errors of metabolism, and XALD is one of those, the key initial round of chemotherapy needs to be much more intense to knock out their native bone marrow and make them ready for said transplantation. And part of that may contribute to the graft failure. There's still a lot of work to be done to dial in procedures to make this as successful as possible, but they are getting better. And long-term survival rates have, in fact, pretty significantly increased over the last few years for XALD patients who go through this process. Now, I mentioned that the cerebral disease it is an important component to transplant success. And I want to describe here a scoring system that was actually developed in the early 90s by Dr. Lowe that 
is a, a zero to 34 point scoring system that's a way of tracking changes in the brain based on MRI imaging. So the, the idea with this scheme is to inspect 34 different regions of the brain and give them a score of zero or one. Zero means normal, one means abnormal. So the lower your score, the more normal the brain is at that point in time. Um, but this is, this is a little bit subjective, and we're talking about the brains of, of relatively young children. Uh, the state of New York actually commented in their papers that they were having trouble with tracking MRIs because there are so many changes that happen normally during development of young children. Things were being miscalled as normal or abnormal. And that before any XALD patient was referred to for bone marrow transplantation, uh, New York has now implemented an independent assessment by an ALD uh, expert in inspecting brain MRIs to make the low score as consistent as possible. And all of the literature out there suggests that if your low score is less than 10, you're much more likely to have a positive outcome. So transplantation is complicated. There's a lot of monitoring involved, and there's a lot of expertise that needs to weigh in to make it successful. So maybe not ideal. What are some things that are in the pipeline to try to make therapy a little better, a little safer? There's a very exciting small molecule gene therapy that's in the works. And what I mean by small molecule is that this is uh, a compound that's actually already been approved by the, or been evaluated, um, and is now being repurposed for rare disease. It's a compound that's a, a mimic of thyroid hormone. So it alters cholesterol and fat metabolism. With the, and they've noted that it upregulates the expression of ABCD2. This is a, a sister transporter to ABCD1 that is actually differentially expressed. So you typically have one transporter or the other. And ABCD2 is typically found in the regions of the brain that are spared by the neurodegeneration. So the hope is that by upregulation and expression of this gene in uh, non-standard or non-native tissues, it may be able to, to compensate and protect from some of the long-term damages of elevated C26 and the progression of XALD. And Seattle Children's is going to be a site for a safety and pharmacokinetics clinical trial of this compound. Uh, start date is still to be determined, but this is an exciting possibility that seems like a, a relatively safe option. Long-term efficacy is still unknown, but it's exciting possibilities and coming soon. So the last uh, therapy under development that I wanted to describe today was actually published in late 2017 and describes gene replacement therapy using a patient's own cells. So what this figure describes is kind of the process that uh, hap went, happened for these patients. I believe there were 17 patients total, and cells were harvested from them. They were cultured and exposed to a viral vector with an intact copy of ABCD1. The viral vector integrated the gene at random throughout the genome. Those cells were, were cultured and assessed for how many copies, so kind of the, the relative expression level of ABCD1, and general viability. Those that were viable were transplanted back into the patient, and the patients were tracked to see what was this as effective as uh, a separate donor bone marrow transplantation. And in general, what they found is that this seemed to work pretty well. Um, unfortunately, with the, the cohort size, they weren't able to nail down a couple of pretty important uh, details, like how many copies of the gene do you really need to stop the cerebral progression? We know that if you have an outside donor and that bone marrow graphs, it will pr stop progression. But how many copies of the gene in your own cells do you need? Is 50% enough? Is 70% enough? Uh, what's the integration rate required? Um, and then there will always be the risk of improper integration and you know, disrupting some other biochemical pathway because of the, where the viral vector integrated. So this is not without its risks, but 
as of the publication, there was no evidence of graft versus host disease, and 15 of the 17 patients had stabilized and were doing very well. Uh, two of them did not do well, but they had more progressive cerebral disease than the rest of the cohort. So this is still under evaluation. It's not available yet for patients, but it is an option coming down the line that may make uh, bone marrow transplants safer in several important ways. So the last section is I wanted to talk about kind of what this, what this means in the short term and even throw out some questions about long-term implications. So newborn screen is, is active. It's, it's went, actually the instrumentation went live yesterday and they will be testing every baby born since March 1st. So that means the blood spot um, from the heel stick will be tested for elevated levels of C26. If detected, those infants will be referred for follow-up testing, specifically the very long chain fatty acid analysis and plasma. Well, the majority will be sent to our lab at Seattle Children's. If there's a pattern suggestive of XALD, they'll get referred to biochemical genetics, where a family history will be very helpful and informative that will probably trigger DNA testing. If there's a mutation in ABCD1, then we start looking at long-term monitoring. So specifically um, getting them hooked up with endocrine for monitoring adrenal function and uh, MRIs, all of this paired with long-term counseling because of the uncertainty of symptoms and age of onset. I wanna tie this briefly back to kind of the opening sequence where you know, ideal, ideal newborn screening has been going after diseases that are pretty devastating fairly early in life, though they may be asymptomatic at birth. This is the first of a set of diseases that people are talking about screening for where the age of onset is variable and we can't necessarily predict it. So this is going to be very long-term follow-up for these patients. Uh, the cerebral form can manifest up until the age of 10 is kind of the, the estimate right now. And it, it may be longer, we, we don't really know. And should we be treating males and females differently? There's no guidelines yet for long-term management. You know, how frequently should we be testing? They are changing so rapidly in the first couple years of life, um, particularly MRI and adrenal function tests can be very challenging to interpret. Um, does it make sense to wait to start monitoring since we know typically XALD patients are gonna be asymptomatic for quite a while? Does it make sense to bring them back in two years? Uh, it gets more complicated. And then this is an X-linked disorder, which means there's a lot of implications for the extended family. You know, say our proband is this, is this fellow right here indicated with the, the black arrow, you know, more than 80% of the time, his mom's gonna have it. She may, be, she may or may not be symptomatic with something that hadn't been uh, recognized previously. And then what if she's got siblings? You know, this is gonna have implications for uncle, uh, aunts and their kids, cousins. How far, do, how far do we go and where does the responsibility lie? These are really, these are still outstanding questions who's responsible for follow-up and communication. And we don't have the answers yet, but I can tell you this is something that people in biochemical genetics in the lab and physicians are worrying about a lot across the country. It's an active topic of debate. So bringing this back to, to kind of wrap things up, I started with a series of questions that really, this was what I was thinking about when the case came across my desk in January. How specific is very long chain fatty acids? Actually, it looks like it's, it's pretty specific, at least when we're looking at, at cases where there's clinical indication and a very specific question. Uh, the clinical information absolutely helps, but the metabolites too, they seem to have different patterns. For our case study, what's gonna happen next for him? Well, he happened to present with primary adrenal insufficiency, so next steps really are gonna be evaluation of his brain, a tracking MRI, getting him hooked up with appropriate resources to kind of see what happens next and make sure uh, those resources are in place for whatever challenges he faces. <laughs>
And it is exciting that there are new therapies underway. So hopefully all of this will get easier and safer with time. There will be more options uh, to address the varying degrees of symptoms. And newborn screening is exciting. This will likely change kind of what we expect the natural history to be for patients with this genetic disorder. Uh, with earlier de de detection and intervention, we may be able to minimize emergency episodes, particularly of the adrenal insufficiency, minimize hospitalizations, and improve long-term outcomes by early intervention. So last slide, I need to thank a lot of people who have helped me put this together, uh, specifically Dr. Rona Jack, Dr. Angela Sun, uh, Dr. Kenwell Deep Mali, and Dr. Gregory Enns. And this is a picture of the biochemical genetics lab team that does all of the clinical testing. And thank you all for listening and being here today. Thank you for that talk. Um, I wonder if you can comment in the algorithm for testing that you showed, what's gonna happen to the patients where, let's say you confirm the biochemical abnormalities, but then they don't have an ABCD1 mutation. What comes next for them? Absolutely, that's a great question. Um, then we're probably going down the pipeline of uh, larger panel testing. So uh, the clinical information will be really helpful to identify the Zellweger spectrum disorder cases. So if we've got abnormalities of the very long chain without any clinical symptoms, we're probably looking at, we would first start with other rarer peroxisomal biogenesis disorders that might take longer to manifest. Um, what panels are available and what those are real realistically going to look like is gonna be harder and challenging. Um, what we don't really know yet are the other nonspecific things that happen to newborns like prematurity and diet. Um, we just, we don't have the data because we don't look at very long chain fatty acids for that population. But it's gonna be an interesting learning experience. Yeah, thank you for the very nice talk. Is the mechanism for the adrenal insufficiency known and is there a defect in other steroid hormone pathways? That is a great question and I don't know. <laughs> um, most of the papers that I've read have focused on really the, the, the general neurologic de degeneration, and I haven't seen anything specifically about what happens with the adrenal glands. So unfortunately, I, I don't know, but that's a great question. Anna, that was great. Thank you. Um, when you hydrolyze the lipids and turn them into the acyl groups, they're, it's kind of boring. You lose a lot of um, lipid information. Are there specific lipids that we should be looking for, do you think, that might predict severity of outcome, et cetera? Maybe certain phosphatidylcholines or ethanolamines or other things I, that might be more informative? That is, a that is also a fantastic question, and you're probably right. There may be better biomarkers for this disease and for different subtypes. I th think historically they've just been very difficult to measure. Um, you can quantify plasmalogens clinically. Uh, there's only, I think, one place that does it. I think it's Kennedy Krieger are the experts. And the abundance is extremely low. So the numbers that they, they put out are, are, are 0.001 are like kind of the, the order of magnitude for disease. Um, so I suspect we just, we haven't had the tools yet to go and explore that. Um, I'm extremely curious to see what happens around plasmalogen biology and you know, exactly what you're saying. Are there other species that these things are supposed to be converted into that are now missing? Um, and we just don't know. Thank you.